Okay, well, my topic this evening is Perilous Times, a Biblical Perspective. So what does the Bible say about perilous times? Well, you know where we would look. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. This know also, <coughs> that's a bad thing about these things you can't get away from. <coughs> this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So the first thing we learn about the biblical view of perilous times, it's in the last days. It's, uh, if we think we're in the perilous times, we must be in the last days. Now how long the last days last? Uh, that's a good question, but I think we've been there for a while. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Wow. Well, I suppose that's al always been true. They call it narcissism. But it is true with a, I've got one, Glenn. Yeah. Thank you. It is true with a vengeance uh, in, in the world we, we live in. And of course, it goes on and talks about uh, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Wow, we hear of all these mothers killing their babies, drowning them in a bathtub or well, we had a case in not far from where I live where they, the mother just threw him over a huge bridge into a ravine because she had gotten a lesbian partner now. And uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, well, I missed false accusers, truce breakers, without natural affection, we read that. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> on the one hand, you would think it would say rescue them. But uh, people that are this far gone are not easy to rescue. And you will find that out as you try. Well, we, we try, but we are not going to be terribly successful. The Lord, of course, would have to have to intervene. But it's just amazing what is going on today. Uh, it used to be recognized that to love yourself was not good. Now it's taught in the church. I'm sure you know that. We have seminars on self-love. We have seminars where they teach you you cannot love God or man or your neighbor until, first of all, you love yourself. That's astonishing. Uh, that's turning the Bible upside down. Lovers of self. Uh, Archibald D. Hart, a Fuller Seminary professor, wrote a book, Me, Myself, and I. Anybody read it? Well, you folks don't read it, but a lot of other people do read those books. And it's all about self, all about loving yourself. Uh, and uh, that's just the opposite of what the Bible teaches. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire that's already out of control. Uh, and it is so unbiblical, but this is what is going on, on today. Humanistic psychologists, uh, I don't know how familiar you would be, and I, don't, and I don't even like to talk about these things. I very seldom think about them or speak about them. But this was the subject, uh, the uh, theme. I don't know if you remember the um, 
uh, oh my goodness, the grand, the, the godfather, I call him the godfather of Christian psychology in America, whom I return to, Bill, referring to. No, 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 this man claims to be a Christian. Naramore, Clyde Naramore. His nephew, uh, where's my brain tonight? His nephew Bruce, thank you, thank you very much. Bruce Naramore makes it very clear. He says, it was humanistic psychologists, Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers, who first made us aware of the need for self-love and self-esteem. So what he's telling you is, he didn't get it out of the Bible. You, you could have searched the Bible for 1900 years. The early church never heard of this. No one else ever heard of it, no Christians. But we learned it from the humanistic psychologists. And what it did for them, you might be interested to know, Carl Rogers, his wife was dying. And, uh, well, you've got to be true to yourself. And she's not going to help you be true to yourself anymore, so he abandoned her for another woman in order to be true to self. Uh, he talked about the altar to self. You must worship self. And, and so forth. So this is the day in which we live. And uh, popular speakers, uh, this is Christian psychology. You might as well talk about Christian Hinduism. Uh, psychology, and uh, we, I'll tell you maybe a little bit more about it tomorrow. But uh, who brought psychology into the church? Well, it was Norman Vincent Peale. Now, if you know a little bit about Norman Vincent Peale, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But it didn't come from the Bible. That's the point. It came from the world. And the Bible tells us that the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. We are not to consult the world. But here the Christian psychologists say, no, we have consulted the world. Because the world has some wisdom that we don't have. In other words, Christian psychology is based upon the belief that the Bible isn't, uh, well, it's not sufficient. It's not uh, all we need. We need something else. Uh, if you would, uh, <clears throat> we don't take time to turn to it, but if you, you know John's Gospel, chapter 8. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, <clears throat> then are you my disciples indeed. I give you the Christian psychologist version. And you will know part of the truth. And you will be set partially free. But I can't set you wholly free because the Holy Spirit, through ignorance or oversight, has left out much in the, in the New Testament that is essential for our psychological well-being. And we're going to have to learn that from the psychologists who are godless atheists, the, all of the founders. And I don't know, there may be some young person here this evening who you're majoring in psychology in university. Sorry to offend you, but you better get out quick um, before it's too late. Uh, and I'm very serious about that. I have talked to too many young people who lost their faith, who majored in psychology, and got, got all tangled up. Well, anyway, I'm spending too much time on that. This is foretold in Scripture. What has it done for the psychologists and the psychiatrists? Well, their profession, these people involved in this profession, they have the highest percentage in, who have been divorced, the highest percentage of suicides, the highest percentage under the care of psychiatrists, and so forth, they, it doesn't work for them. It's like going to a bald-headed barber to teach you how to grow your hair or something. I mean, <clears throat> why should we expect them to give us advice? I, I remember when I'm, I'm a little older than most of you folks. Uh, when I was a freshman in university, I, I don't want to insult some people here, but it was common knowledge on the campus. Those people who were majoring in psychology, they were kooks. 
And that's why they majored in psychology, to find out what was wrong with themselves. Uh, and it didn't really help. <clears throat> but then, what do you know? It is the most popular, uh, or among the most popular subjects in universities and in Christian universities. Uh, for example, at uh, Jerry Falwell's Liberty University, I remember when it first came in. I remember when they invited me to speak there. And I spoke to the psychologist, psychology department. Wow, did they get upset. Well, of course, I was never invited back. Uh, but how do we explain this? Well, you know, you could have a PhD. And you could be academically respected. And you could hold your head up in the academic world. And uh, you could really be somebody that's, I'm afraid, uh, uh, at least part of the motiv motivation. And I don't have much respect for that uh, academic world. But the influence of psychology, it is rampant uh, in, in the church. Well, you wouldn't think Christians would fall for this. I mean, it is so obviously anti-biblical. And yet the Christian world has fallen for it hook, line, and sinker. And the <clears throat> most popular books in the Christian bookstores, most popular speakers at conferences, are the Christian psychologists. And what do they have to offer? Well, nothing from the Bible. I can, I can guarantee you that. Well, how did it come into the church? Well, I see, I, didn't, I was going to say that tonight. I didn't even bring that part of my notes with me. It came through Robert Schuller. If you know anything about Robert Schuller, well, I'll have to, I, I want to give you some real documentation. But Robert Schuller said, it's, uh, the worst thing you can do is tell someone they're a sinner. Well, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, so you've, you've wiped out a whole, everybody from being saved. If you can't tell them that they're sinners, Robert Schuller says you must always be positive. Well, what does that mean? Positive, if you're talking electricity or magnetism or chemical bonding, uh, then positive and negative have some meaning. But we're talking about truth. Jesus, was Jesus positive when he said, you hypocrites, you whited sepulchers, uh, except you repent, you will perish? No, no, you don't use that kind of language. I mean, uh, you know, that's, that's, you're not going to win friends and influence people with that kind of language. You want to be dishonest with them. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor and someone comes to me and they've got a ruptured appendix and I know if they're not on the operating table within 15 minutes, they're dead. But I wouldn't want to shatter their fragile self-esteem. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to offend them. So I say, well, you're, you're doing okay. If you get a little pain, uh, just uh, take an aspirin. And if you get more pain, well, I'll, I'll give you some, uh, you know, something stronger, morphine or whatever. Uh, you, you'll, you'll get through it eventually. Well, you're lying to them and you're killing them. And when you lead people into Christian psychology, you are lying to them. You are denying the word of God and you are really putting them in, in, in danger. Well, the, the apostle doesn't talk about, it's interesting, he doesn't talk about terrorism. He doesn't say, now in the last days, you're going to have some dangerous times because there's going to be suicide bombers running around, and we could have some here in the U.S. Uh, don't kid yourself. Uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing that we have it already. No, he doesn't talk about that. However, there is a relationship. How many of you have read the book Lond Londonistan? Anybody? Londonistan. Okay, one person. <laughs> oh, two. <laughs> oh, sorry, Yaakov, you're from over there. Uh, written by a British lady. Excellent. Terrific. Not a, not a Christian. And it just goes down, she just goes down the list. Where, what happened to England? 
Well, you had Egypt and, and Saudi Arabia and Muslim countries complaining, right? Complaining to Britain. London has become the headquarters for international terrorism. We want you to do something about it. And Britain would not do anything about it. Why? Oh, because we should be broad-minded, you know. Relativism had come into their universities. Relativism had come into their societies. Nothing is wrong or right. There's one thing. <laughs> Don't tell Jacob. Christianity. This is a not only a post Christian society, it is an anti Christian society. Muslims are accepted. Everybody's accepted, but not Christians, because that is so narrow minded and dogmatic. And you probably heard me mention uh, Alan Bloom, uh, until then an unknown uh, Chicago University uh, philosophy professor. And he wrote a book titled. The Closing of the American Mind. How many of you read that besides Yaakov? <laughs> okay. Interesting title. He said, the one virtue in America is openness. Open to everything. We wouldn't say anything is wrong and something is right. You might offend people. And he says, we have become so open to everything that our minds have become closed to the possibility something might be right and something else wrong. Well, that's where we are. Closing of the American mind through openness. And there, this is where, where we are in the United States. So there is a relationship between the moral breakdown in society and the flooding in of, of terrorism. Uh, because we have no standard for standing up against it. And unless we do something about this, we are doomed. And I'm not uh, a pessimist well, without the Lord's, the Lord's intervention. Now, one of the, uh, well, there are many interesting things. But you remember, oh, turn to uh, Matthew 24, because if we're talking about signs of the, of the last days, you know that that's where, where we get a whole list of them. And I, you know, the very first thing he talks about is disciples come and ask him, verse 3, what will be the sign of your coming to end the world and so forth? And the first thing Jesus said was, verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. Well, the number one sign, spiritual deception, moral deception. You are going to be deceived, and you better be careful, because this is what is coming upon us, and this is the major sign of the last days. And he goes on, he says, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, shall deceive many. And he goes on to verse, uh, verse 11, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Wow, this is a big movement. It's not just a few people will be deceived, but many people will be deceived. And you go to verse 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Oh, there's a signs and wonders movement coming along. Uh, Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, one of those signs is rather interesting. Go down to verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation. Now, I don't know anything about Greek or Hebrew. It could just as well all be Chinese to me. But you... I, I don't... I, that's what I'm going to say, Yaakov. <laughs> uh, uh, but... Uh, You can look it up like I do. You don't have to rely on Yaakov. You just look it up in your concordance. <laughs> and the word there for nation is ethnos. Amazing prophecy. 
There will be a time coming with ethnic group against ethnic group. Are we in that day? We absolutely are. Let me just give you a, a, a list of some of these. You got the Turks and the Armenians. In Kenya, you got the Kikuyus and the Luos. In Rwanda, you had the Hutus and the Tutsis. In Iraq, of course, the Shias and the Sunnis. And in the Balkans, you have the Serbs and the Kosovar Albanians. In India, Kashmiri Hindus and Islamic uh, faction against them, and so forth. There's a list of many more, but I'm going to run out of time if I don't move on. Amazing prophecy, Jesus said. It's going to be ethnos against ethnos. And we see that today like we've never seen it before. But the main thing that he's uh, talking about is moral deterioration. Now he said there would be false prophets. And the list is too long even to begin to name them, let alone describe them. But let me just give you one of the most outrageous. Uh, Pastor Hinkle was the man's name. He was on TBN. And he said, oh, a voice spoke to me. This is a prophecy from the Lord. And what did the Lord say? I'm going to rip all evil out of this world. What? Even before the Antichrist comes, he's going to rip all evil out? I didn't think evil was something you could rip out. I thought it was in people's hearts. I mean, it is so pitifully unbiblical and irrational that any child could recognize this. Any Sunday school child. All but Paul and Jan Crouch. Woo! Wow! Oh, amazing! And, uh, well, it was confirmed by other false prophets. Pat Robertson. Well, they have wild applause on TVN. Pat Robertson, uh, he backed it up. And, uh, and others of these false prophets. Oh, yes, it's going to happen. Wow, this is an amazing prophecy. God said next June 9th he's going to rip all evil out of the world. That's pitiful. Who would believe it? I don't want to call them idiots, but they're certainly biblically illiterate and irrational. But yet June 9th came and went and nothing happened. And they said, yes, there was a fulfillment of the prophecy. And I won't go into all those details. What nonsense we have. False prophets. Wow. Um, Oral Roberts, and, and you know, I don't enjoy talking about this. I hope you understand that. I do not enjoy talking about this. And I don't even think about it. I haven't thought about it since last time I was asked to talk about it. But Pat Robertson, he's one of the premier false prophets out there. I don't know what you think of Pat Robertson, the 700 Club. I don't want to offend any of you folks. He was asked by one of his biographers, actually, uh, if God called you to run for president, why, this is in writing, folks, why did you fail to get the Republican presidential nomination? What do you think he would, how would we explain that? Well, very simple. He says, I suppose we could ask the same question of Jesus. God sent him to be the Messiah of Israel and King of Israel, and he failed. Why did he fail the first time around and get crucified? So the crucifixion was a failure? It was a fulfillment of prophecy? I mean, what do these people use for brains? And what do they use for a Bible? And yet, ooh, marvelous, amazing, and the money pours in. Uh, well, Oral Roberts, where am I? I had it here a minute ago. Oral Roberts, what a false prophet he is. This, is. this man was really incensed. This was the widower of a woman who had died. And listen to what he says. This was published in a newspaper. Upon the urging of my terminally ill wife, I poured hundreds of dollars into the Oral Roberts empire. She was brainwashed into the belief that he and God would restore her. Approximately one year after her death, 
he received a letter addressed to her over the signature of Oral Roberts, in which he claimed that he had had a talk with God the previous night who had assured him that my wife would be made whole. Now, is he in touch with God? I'll ask you a simple question. Is that, did he hear from God? Of course not. Now, he is either a liar, which I would say he is, or he's hallucinating, or he's got a demon telling him something. Now, you take your pick. I was having a little discussion with um, uh, oh my goodness, where's my, my brain this evening? With, um, well, I'll think of it in a moment. Uh, that's emb embarrassing. You all know his name very well. He was, the pa he was the pastor for Paul and Jan Crouch, he said. Hayford, thank you. Jack Hayford. And Tom and I were having a little discussion with him. And one of the things he asked us was, he was not happy with what we were writing and saying, well, what about these men? Are you saying that they're not Christians? I said, let me ask you the question. Someone who teaches that unless you believe that Jesus Christ went to hell and was beaten up by Satan and all, almost tormented to, to the end, and that's the only way you get saved, you must believe that. Is he a Christian? Is that the gospel? What do you think of somebody who lies? I don't think these people even believe in God. If you really had an ounce of the fear of God, would you just make these false statements and attribute it to God? Benny Hinn says, oh, he's right in the throne room of God. Oh, yes, God is telling me now. And I could give you a whole list of his false prophecies, which I, I don't enjoy to do. But one of the false prophecies, this was in 1989, God is going to destroy the homosexual community in America by fire by 1994 or 95 at the latest. You folks remember reading about that in the newspaper? Was that a false prophecy? What about Oral Roberts who says, God told me I had a, a, a seven hour conversation with a 900 foot Jesus. It's quite a, quite a substantial hallucination if that's what it is. Uh, who told me that if I would build this city of faith this hospital, which the city council said, the planning commission said, it's not needed, we don't want it. But he talked his followers into sending in millions and millions of dollars to build a high rise with 777 hospital beds, the most that were ever occupied, 147. This 900 foot Jesus had promised him miracles a cure for cancer. None of that ever happened. What happened to the hospital? Well, you know what happened to it. They went bankrupt. And he had to sell it off in desperation to pay off some debts. But in spite of that, well, this was God's timing. This is what he said. God showed us that this, this was his timing. Could you buy a lie like that? I mean, here I've got a letter in my hands. Oral Roberts has been up all night praying for me. Wow! My name's right in there in that letter. And in the process of praying for me all night, God has revealed to him 33 specific blessings that he wants to give to me. Wow! Now, of course, several hundred thousand people got the same letter with their names put in there by computer. The same 33 blessings that he'd been revealed for each of them, praying all night and so forth. The man is a liar. And I just ask you again, if you really believe that God exists, and that one day you will stand before him in judgment, would you dare to tell lies like that? I don't think you would. I don't see how you could. I don't think these people 
believe God exists. That's my opinion, just based on logic. How could they? Benny Hinn, of course, so many false prophecies and, and the others, and I, I don't want to dwell on that any, any longer. Now, Christ warns of the same. You know, this is a signs and wonders movement, a false signs and wonders movement. And you know what he says in Matthew. Well, we're in Matthew 24. We can easily turn back to Matthew 7. But I'm preaching to the choir. You folks have probably been to a few of these conferences. And you haven't heard me talking about it in a long time. But verse, um, Matthew 7, verse 21. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. This is many, not just a few. Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, you know, Jesus said, I know my sheep and I'm known of mine. He's saying, I never knew you. Never knew you. This is not a verse for falling away, losing your salvation. Oh, you were going along really well, Benny Hinn. So you got off the track. No, I never knew you. Could there be people like that on radio and television? I think the place is full of them. I think they're everywhere. They're preaching a false gospel. It's not the truth of the word of God, and they seem to have no moral conscience about it. Now, if you went to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you know the verse I'm going to turn to, 2 Timothy, well, I can quote it, but let me, let me turn to it so we know that we are there. Verse 8. Well, he gives you, we were, we were there, we're going back to where we were. This, this list of things describes our society today. Verse 8. Now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the, the faith. Well, who are these people? Well, Jannies and Jambres were the sorcerers in Pharaoh's court. And how did they withstand Moses and Aaron? Oh, there's no such thing as God. We're, we're atheists. No such thing as miracles. No. God is telling you the opposition to the truth in the last days, a major opposition, not all of the opposition, but a major opposition, isn't going to be from atheistic, humanistic professors in universities. It's going to be inside the church. Inside the church. You did it in my name. Yes, Lord, didn't we do it in your name? And what does it and entail. Well, it's like Jannies and Jambres. How did they withstand Moses? By the power of Satan, they duplicate, duplicated the miracles that God did through Moses and Aaron up to a point until God would not allow them to do it anymore. So we read that the opposition, a major opposition to the truth in the last days, will be lying signs and wonders. People who claim to be doing miracles, and if they're doing any at all, it's in the power of Satan. Uh, so again, the Bible agrees. We have the we have the testimony of of more than one witness. Benny Hinn can't even get his testimony straight. He's given three different versions. He got saved in Israel before eighty one. Uh, then he got saved in Canada just after eighty one. Then he got saved in his senior year of high school. Well, the problem is he dropped out after the junior year, so he never became a senior. So the question is, when did he get saved, and which one of these so-called testimonies is accurate? They contradict one another. Does the man know when he got saved? Is he saved? I don't think so, for the reasons that, that, I've, 
that I've already given you. Okay, well, part of, part of what this is all about is money. And Oral Roberts dreamed up the seed faith idea. Uh, this was Oral Roberts' invention. It's not in the Bible. He tried to justify it from the Bible. And he's the one that dreamed up the idea, you plant a seed in my ministry. Um, money seed, of course. And God will repay you 100-fold. Wow, that's tempting. I give you $100 and I get 10000 back? Wow. People believe these lies. It's incredible. Year after year after year, this seed faith was picked up by all the others, the Copelands and everybody else, and now you'll hear it. Oh, plant a seed of faith in my ministry, and God will, will repay it. And Paul and Jan Crouch say it and so forth. Well, what does this seed reap? Well, I'll tell you, it reaps money for these phonies. I, I will not hesitate to call them phonies. They're frauds. Uh, and the Bible says so clearly. You gotta, I, I've got a whole list of the mansions they live in. Millions and millions of dollars. I, I mean, uh, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. Wow. They've got twin jet airplanes. His and her jets. I think they're $20 million a piece. The Benny Hinn. Oh, my goodness. You Just go... You don't have to listen to me. Google it. Just go and Google about the wealth of these people and you will be shocked. Joyce Meyer. Wow, I think her wedding cost a million bucks, was it? Yeah, a million bucks. It describes her gown and the diamonds. And, and I think there were a thousand guests and so forth. What is this? This is the pure bride of Christ? This is depicting the bride of Christ? Uh, it's, uh, it is so far from being biblical. Then we have false teachers, false doctrines, the Bible says. One of the false doctrines, well, uh, it's dual covenant. Now, John Hagee, uh, he says, let me quote him, trying to convert Jews is a waste of time. The Jewish person who has his roots in Judaism is not going to convert to Christianity. Everyone else needs to believe in Jesus, but not Jews. They already have a covenant with God that has never been replaced by Christianity. Targeting the Jewish people for mass evangelism is fruitless. If God has judicially blinded the Jews concerning Christ, why are Christians berating them for not believing in him? Well, I guess God didn't know about this. These people come up with a lot of doctrine that God wasn't aware of. What did Jesus say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone except the Jews. Is that what he said? Because they already have a covenant? To everyone. What did, what did Paul say in Romans 1.16? The gospel is the power of God unto everyone who believes it to the what? To the Jew first, also to the Gentile. <clears throat> Sounds like God was not aware of this doctrine. And you certainly can't find it in, in, the, in the Bible. I don't want to be sarcastic, but I don't know how else to deal with these people. Because how is it? They are followed by millions. The more lies... Benny Hinn utters, the more false prophecies he comes out with, the larger his following grows. It reminds you of the Bible, the verse in the Old Testament where God mourns, my people love to have it so. Oh, that's what you want. Okay, that's what you're going to get. And I can tell you one of my prayers. I don't know how God will answer it because we've got problems on both sides. But uh, I say, God, please don't give America what she deserves in this next election coming up. Well, I don't know whether God has many choices, but uh, maybe, maybe he can work something out. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping so. Well, it's a sorry scene out there. 
of course, they're all claiming to be God. Uh, the Bible says, you know what God says? Well, it says, what, what was the lie of the serpent? You shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And we don't want to be like the Mormons. Mormonism is based upon the belief, well, uh, Brigham Young, preaching from the Tabernacle Choir, said, the devil told the truth. We don't call what Mother Eve did sin. We don't blame Mother Eve <clears throat> because, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> we don't blame Mother Eve because that's how we become gods. The very lie of the serpent is the foundation for the Mormon church. And they're not ashamed of it. Ah, but it's being taught on TBN, being taught in Christian circles. Let me quote just a few of them. Creflo Dollar. That's an interesting name. I don't think it was original. Well, it might have been. You are God's. Spell it with a little G because you came from God. But Jesus, Jesus didn't come as God. He came as a man. And he didn't come perfect. What? I mean, they utter blasphemy after blasphemy. And Christians follow them by the millions. In conversation with Kenneth Copeland, he said, quote, my whole attitude now should be that I have equality with God. What? Equality with God? More Cirillo, he's not going to be left out. He says, from the beginning of time, the whole purpose of God was to reproduce himself. And when we stand up here, brother, you're not looking at more Cirillo. You're looking at God. You're looking at Jesus. It's a miracle they're not struck down uh, right with those words. Uh, well, we've got the kingdom now, and we, I'm running out of time. We can't go into that. Uh, we've got, uh, it's, w what is this teaching? Well, the whole idea is that we're not going to meet Jesus in the air, as the Bible says. But when we meet Jesus, we'll meet him with our feet planted on planet Earth. And he will have come not to take us to heaven in the rapture, but to rule over the kingdom that we have established for him on this Earth. I mean, how greater a lie could you get than that? And that is taught by the kingdom now people. Earl Polk, I noticed he's just uh, Earl Polk. Uh, Pitiful man, he's uh, head of a 12,000, well, at one time, 12,000 members in his church. And he was involved in so much immorality, and he defends it, and it finally catches up with him. Now, you got a different timing than, than how did I go by him? Okay. <clears throat> you got a different timing, but anyway. Uh, the Lord's timing for the rapture. I think it's pretty soon. I think it's coming very soon. You know? And the signs are out there. And, uh, well, we have exalted ourselves above God. Jesus said, except you deny self, take up the cross and follow me. You cannot be my disciple. Well, but you're, we're not going to go by that. Uh, we don't like that. <clears throat> this can't be true. This must be a false interpretation of the Bible. I mean, the flesh goes against that. But it's what Jesus said. And it makes sense. We, we don't do what we want to do. But uh, we do what he wants us to do. And I hope that that's the goal of your life. We'll talk about <coughs> false faith tomorrow morning, I think. Some people think that faith is if I can just believe that what I'm praying for will happen. Well, that's faith. So I, I, I would wager that there, I don't wager. I would, I'm sure that there are some people here tonight, you think, 
but you're praying for healing, or you're praying for this, or you're praying for that. If I can just believe that what I'm praying for will happen, that's faith. I've got to somehow believe. Well, if things happen, just logically, because you believe they will happen, you don't need God. That's mind power. No. Is it God's will? Is it God's way? Is it God's timing? That prayer can only be answered if he answers it. You can say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea. Well, I can't do that. But if I know that this is God's will, then as a man of God, I can speak to that mountain to move. But only then. I, can't, I don't have the power in myself. I must, what, what do you want in life? I'll just end with one final question. What do you want? And what do I want? Do you want God to give you what you want? Or do you want to receive from God what he knows is best for you? That's the question. And these people are all about getting their own way. Kenneth Hagin, he's, he's gone now. You know, one of his booklets was How to Write Your Own Ticket with God. Oh, yeah, how to tell God what you want and to get him to give it to you. Jesus said you haven't even begun to pray until you say, not my will, but thine be done. So the church, you can see, it's off course. It's left the Bible. It has left common sense. And it has left the Holy Spirit behind, but they're doing all of this in the name of Christ and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And it's a tragedy. Well, why do we talk about it? Well, because it's wrong, and we're going to try to rescue people as, as, as best we can if they will listen to the truth. Okay? Thank you. Sorry to bother you with all of this stuff.